Well, good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch, and welcome back to our webcasters who are attending in whatever time zone you're, you're in. Um, this next panel is going to focus on really the sine qua non of evaluation, which is data. It's our holy grail. It's also the rock upon which many evaluation hopes get dashed, in, in honesty. So we're going to talk a bit about, the again, the good, the bad, and the ugly of data capture uh, management analysis, uh, but starting with mapping. So um, we have one, a wonderful set of panelists for this session. Um, and again, we won't go through all the introductions, but Martin Vesson from ICF International, Kara Hansen from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, John Simon from Boston University, uh, and uh, Batia Alou from uh, ICAP at Columbia, and uh, Victoria Fan from the Center for Global Development. So we will um, try to have conversation in some focused areas um, of, of data uh, uh, mapping, and then we'll have time uh, to have our conversation in Q&A, which I think has been very fruitful so far. So obviously, you know, regardless of the scale of any intervention, data are, are key, um, and being able to d design and execute an effective evaluation is dependent on it. So one of the things that we found very useful in the PEPFAR evaluation, and many of you may have used, and we think is a key step um, in the process, is to try to map available data sources, um, as well as data that might be uh, needed to be collected. Um, this becomes an iterative process for those of you who've been through it, obviously, um, and it's a step that it may be undertaken in many evaluations, but isn't always documented in the methodology, and I think that's one thing we also want to talk about. But being able to obviously um, look at some of the issues um, around the availability of one's data set, what kind of quantitative or qualitative uh, or both data uh, might be needed. Um, across program components and interventions, and this includes denominators for using metrics or to disaggregate, for example. Having to assess the time periods available of the data that are there, uh, whether it's pre-post, longitudinal, et cetera. Are there routinely collected program data, and we've talked about that, that may be available and usable um, towards the ends of the, of the evaluation? If not, uh, or in addition, are new data required? And so, if so, who's going to collect them, and how will that be done, what methods will be used? Um, and then that requires a whole other set of thinking around the team composition for the data capture uh, uh, management and analysis. Accessibility issues. This is a really big area in, in that there are large questions around who owns the data, who can access it, if data are requested, by whom, from whom, who will, who will, who will capture the data. Um, if they're not publicly available, how do you gain permissions uh, for their use? What goes into a data sharing agreement? How much time does it take to execute those agreements when there's a time limited, often a time limited uh, period for the evaluation itself? Just being able to request and re-request and uh, receive and check uh, the data um, is, is another whole process. Um, and getting the corresponding tools that might go with the data set, like data dictionaries, uh, may take a great deal of time, actually, in trying to, uh, to capture. Um, how much, uh, how formatted are the data in terms of usability? Will there need to be extraction and cleaning, transformation for the evaluator use? Um, and then in the other direction, you know, will the data that, I think this is a theme we've talked about several times this morning already, the data that are gathered by an evaluator, will they be made available for use by others, other evaluators, uh, other people interested in, in the program, and then the program itself, as, as I think we've heard pretty consistently. In terms of data quality, um, and again, this is where the heartbreak often comes in, um, just in terms of uh, timeliness um, and, and uh, 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 the um, depth of the, of the data that are available. Have there been quality assessments that are perform have already been performed by the owners of the collector of the data? Um, sometimes this requires active discussions and collaborations between the evaluating staff and the program staff. Uh, the, again, the review of uh, monitoring and evaluation and reporting guidances, uh, review, review of the scope and completeness of the data files received, and use of complementary sources of data that may be outside of the program but would be relevant to the evaluation. Feasibility, um, again, conducting a structured data inventory and mapping process at the beginning of an evaluation can help determine the time, effort, and resources, both human and financial, that will be needed to uh, access and ensure the quality of the data. And this is a major, obviously, uh, decision point step uh, in, the, um, in the process of collecting data. Uh, the appropriateness and, and uh, um, utility for the evaluation aims is another um, 
key point to consider in the process. So additional layers, uh, additional considerations to think about when evaluating complex, large uh, complex <coughs> evaluations. There are obviously, as we've discussed, multiple layers of collection, data collection and reporting from the very local level to the regional, to the country um, and uh, higher headquarter level, global level. So what level of data are needed to evaluate the, the questions uh, in the evaluation aims? Um, careful planning of routine data collection can improve feasibility and use of, of, of internal and external evaluations, but there has to be a matching uh, to, of that process. So different data are often collected, as we know, for different time periods and for different uses and different components of the program, and that may help when looking at some subset uh, questions of the evaluation, but may be limited to a specific uh, scope or geographical area and may limit the ability to generalize. And again, just finally, the issues around data ownership, um, which goes at, at many different levels. Uh, the country ownership of the data, the program ownership of the data, uh, and how the, the sharing agreements can be structured. So just to sort of give you an example from the uh, PEPFAR evaluation, we did do a data mapping process that was fairly extensive at the beginning. Um, we used this kind of a matrix that you can see here. And again, in each of the areas that we were mandated to evaluate in PEPFAR, which was prevention services, um, uh, care, uh, and gender, health system strengthening, uh, and other areas, we had subgroups that came up with evaluation questions that the group felt would be germane to, uh, for the evaluation to, to collect information on and to assess. As you can see, there could be quite a list of these. This is just for the PMTCT section, uh, prevention of maternal to child transmission area of evaluation of the PEPFAR program. And so we, that we have this completed, this matrix was all filled out as, as it was for all the areas, but that's an internal document. But you can just sort of see from this mapping process um, what this looked like. We, we wanted to identify all the complementary data sources. We wanted to look at feasibility and fit with evaluation aims. Um, and um, where there were not ideal or available data for each specific question. We had to think about whether it was going to be comparatively easy to get additional data. Um, and this was all mapped then to the type of data, program monitoring, financial, clinical, surveillance, interview data, document review, uh, where the data were located, how accessible they were, and uh, methods that would be used to, um, to collect them. So the, the mapping process also, also took into account the priority of the questions that would, would be answered. We couldn't answer all the questions, nor were the data available to answer all the questions. The time frame cover, the geographic scope covered by the data, accessibility uh, of, of the data, and feasibility for, for getting it. Um, and just to give you a big summary picture, and again, this is in the PEPFAR evaluation documents, you can see all the uh, data sources that we did use in, in the PEPFAR evaluation. Uh, we did obviously uh, tried to look at as many data sources as possible, including financial data, and we'll have more conversation about that in the panel. Um, often though, with financial data, you will have a planned expenditure or not necessarily actual expenditure, so that's one limitation. We did document review, which uh, was uh, discussed briefly by, by Bob Black, extensive document review of the country ownership plans and uh, many of the reports, so thousands and thousands of pages. Um, some subsets of interview uh, of, of, of PEPFAR data were available only for certain time periods or only for certain subsets of the program. So again, one of those limitations that's, that's available there. We did conduct uh, interviews both at headquarters and at the USG <coughs> level with stakeholders, as well as in the uh, uh, 13 countries in which there were country visits made with a variety of purposefully sampled um, uh, stakeholders, implementers, and others. But it requires a lot of, uh, it required a lot of really figuring out what sources were available. Did we have what we thought we had at, at the outset? And an iterative process of adjusting um, as we went, uh, once we've mapped out the data sources that, were, that we thought we would have. So I think I will not take too much more time on this, just to mention that the full report for the PEPFAR evaluation, at least, is available online. Um, and we do outline in more detail the, uh, the data. Uh, <laughs> Uh, processes and, and, and issues that we approached in the uh, Chapter 2, Appendix C. So just in the interest of moving forward, we'll move on now to our next speaker, which is uh, Martin Vesson.
Hello. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some data issues with the Global Fund evaluation. Most of those issues probably have already been addressed in one of the many reports that have been generated uh, since the evaluation was conducted, which was in basically in 19, uh, 2007 and 2008. And things may have changed also considerably since then with respect to some of the issues that I will be mentioning, as you heard from uh, Daniel earlier on. Uh, So basically, this morning you already told that the Global Fund evaluation basically had three components. Uh, I will only talk about uh, component three, uh, the impact uh, assessment. Um, the, uh, oh, come on. Okay. In component three, uh, we enlisted uh, 18 countries. And 18 of all 18 countries basically had, in terms of data, national record reviews on all three diseases, AIDS, and uh, co covering surveillance, ART, PMTCT, et cetera, and then TB, malaria, plus any other existing information, really, that's available in a country. That's to say, uh, for all countries, we tried to collect as much information as we could on the three diseases that was readily available. In an additional... Um, Sorry, this, this should be eight. Uh, in an additional eight countries, we had new data collection. And the new data collection was concentrated on districts within a country. And as you can see, very extensive. We had a district household survey, survey of women, a facility census, community-based organization survey, a survey from district medical offices, ART follow-up study, TV outcome study, hospital record review, facility record review, national health accounts. Um, sorry, now I have to go back. Um, it was to be someone else, okay, that's it. Um, so a, a very, very large um, number of surveys that were conducted at a district level. Now, First of all, we had a problem at a district level in the sense that we wanted to classify districts according to high performing and low performing. And for that, we needed information. And the first thing that basically we found out was that at the national level, it's very difficult to get all the district level information that would allow you to classify uh, districts correctly. So basically, in the end, the district classification really wasn't used um, uh, for the analysis. Um, but the, uh, sorry, uh, one of the important things here uh, I want to mention is different from what we've talked about so far, in the sense that you look at this kind of information and you have to realize that all this information is collected by local institutions and by countries. It's not collected by the Global Fund or by us, it's collected by local organizations with assistance from people tasked with uh, uh, carrying out the, uh, this uh, evaluation, any other evaluation for that matter, in collaboration with local agencies. So this is a lot of work, and not only is a lot of work, it's very difficult. And I, I want to stress this, that it's very difficult. It's very difficult even to go to a district and to find out how many health facilities are there really? How many NGOs? How many civil society organizations that provide uh, services to HIV AIDS patients are there in a particular district? So um, I think it's important to stress this because this is a key component. You not only uh, can we map uh, data sources and say this is a source, but we have to assess if the source really will be doable. We will define who is it that will actually access those sources and get that information. And I think this is a part of the, of the work that maybe hasn't gotten enough attention. So it's really key that we have very strong local implementing agencies that we can work with, that listen to the people uh, that are working with them in terms of providing technical assistance and uh, that are open to, uh, to working according to the guidelines established for the evaluation. 
this is not always the case, uh, like the Global Fund devaluation had three countries that dropped out, they basically didn't want to participate, and we replaced one, or the Global Fund replaced one, but two basically didn't participate. And those are realities, you know, we have to deal with. Um, Overall, um, the household surveys and the facility surveys provided data that were of reasonable quality, good quality. But for most other information, the, the data quality was uneven, you know, according to uh, for many of the countries. Um, I mentioned already the civil society organizations information, which was really uh, very deficient. The medical financial officers information was basically non-existent. And typically uh, any information regarding funding and financing was very, very difficult. I won't go into that because that's the subject for uh, a special uh, session here this afternoon. Um, one of the factors uh, looking at the uh, the large number of activities that were to be carried out in the countries, one of the factors that had a big impact was that really we hadn't pre-tested any of these approaches properly, say in one country, before going wholesale into working with, uh, with 18 countries. Um, exception were probably the household survey and the facility survey because they drew mostly on experiences gained in the DHS and the mix and other national level surveys and there was enough experience to kind of say okay we go with that however you know the global fund evaluation can of course uh, be used to focus uh, new evaluations on key aspects that need to be in place to do uh, a good job on this so for this and some of that has already been done according to danielle this morning uh, monitoring and evaluation systems need to be improved at all levels um, you know, weak sub-national data cannot constitute strong national data. You know, if we have national data, the question we have to ask is, where did they come from? If they come from weak sub-national data, I don't know what it means. Uh, so we need to really look at data at all levels if they are data that are rolled up from one facility to another. Uh, basically, uh, what we, uh, what I came up with was uh, three steps that we need to pay attention to, and a lot of this again has already been said also in some other meetings. They're very evident, actually. We need to define all the indicators that need to be measured, preferably, preferably standardized and harmonized, you know, with indicators that already are being used by other donors or countries, so that we don't have a proliferation of indicators that differ, sometimes in a minor way, but they're not the same. We should strive to have indicators that largely are the same. And this will uh, really facilitate the use of data later on, because you have data that mean the same. If you don't, it poses a real problem. Um, we also should look at um, indicators that already exist you know, there are many, say, DHS surveys, mix surveys, LSMS surveys, you name it, other data collection activities, have a series of indicators that already have been defined. So if you find a new indicator, you won't hopefully be try to make it the same as the ones we have. It may not be possible, but at least should be looked at. So if you have, uh, uh, what you can call it, uh, um, discrimination factors uh, against HIV AIDS or, or something like that, maybe <laughs> use that kind of approach used in those surveys to get that or um, at least don't come up with something that's totally different because it's not conducive to uh, using all the information that is available to do the best evaluation you can. Um, and of course, in order to do that, we need to strengthen the data collection systems that are necessary to collect the indicators. And here you come up to mapping, and it's not just mapping. In the mapping, we may have to say, okay, it maps to this particular data collection system, but then we have to evaluate the system in terms of whether or not it really supports you know, the collection of this indicator. And uh, it may come to the stage where one has to decide Okay, certain indicators I may not collect. It may be too difficult, too cumbersome to collect certain indicators for the advantage or the contribution that they will provide. Um, and of course, uh, the major part is that 
uh, we have to arrange for regular quality assessments for all these systems in terms of accuracy, timeliness, and completeness. Uh, there's a little uh, anecdote here. Uh, at one time, I'm sitting in a South African country with high HIV prevalence in the Ministry of Health, and lo and behold, a lady pilot walked into the office with a pen drive, and she had information that fed into their routine reporting system. And the guy put it in and looked at it and said, well, this is incomplete. And she said, but you said today was the last day that we could provide the information. I mean, there was just kind of a disconnect. There was a huge effort to collect the information, given that this person had flown to very outlying areas to actually come back with the information. At the same time, there was not enough emphasis on saying, look, just make sure it's complete when we get it. You know, it was a very telling uh, example. So then also we make, to make sure that all these systems actually can roll up if they come from facilities. And uh, more importantly, or importantly, uh, and also mentioned this morning, we need to define specific analytical uh, methods or uh, approaches that we will use to analyze the data that are collected. Um, the Global Fund in general has uh, collected a wealth of, evalu of uh, information. Most of it is not really exploited in the overall reports. Every country had its own report. And in the country reports, one can find all these sources of information with their shortcomings, if you like, but there is information on all of those in most of the countries. And the richness of the information of the country reports is much greater than the synthesis report, which tries to draw general conclusions. So um, one of the things is that, that, that really the contribution of the Global Fund would be that countries have a lot of information about data sources, their completeness, their quality, and they can work on improving them if they have decided that this is a source that they really want to emphasize uh, you know, for the future. And then a final point, uh, and, and again, I'm not going into detail because Peter is going to talk about it, is data access. Once the evaluation is finished, all the data are put somewhere, and it's finished. But really, all the information should be available later on. But I'll leave it to Peter to make that case. Thank you. So I was also asked to talk about data in the context of the AMFM evaluation. No. Ah. Products. So just to recap um, what Catherine uh, summarized this morning is we, we, we were lucky. We had a limited number of evaluation questions. And we were asked to measure availability, affordability, market share and use of anti-malarial, of, uh, anti specifically of, of quality assured ACTs. We were actually given in the request for proposals quite a detailed evaluation design. And that original design called for outlet surveys that would be basically newly collected primary data at, at baseline and at end line, household surveys that would be new, newly collected. And then there were two additional studies that were part of the original terms of reference. One was about market dynamics, and the other was uh, an institutional study thinking about scalability. During the course of this uh, negotiation uh, through the inception period, the final evaluation looked quite different. It, had, uh, it did have the primary outlet surveys. It also had, uh, in the end, um, these remote area studies in, in Kenya and Ghana looking at those outlet survey outcomes in more remote areas of those countries that were deemed to be fast moving. Um, the household surveys, as Catherine said, were removed um, and it was a decision was made to rely on secondary data where the timing was appropriate. So basically to use DHS, MIS, MIX, or ACT watch surveys. And then in addition, um, we uh, added a component of 
of country case studies where we had key, inter key informant interviews and document reviews to document the implementation process and context. Then there were these other two um, sources. There was focus groups and exit surveys around the understanding of the AMFM logo and a uh, review of the operations research studies that were commissioned uh, separately by the Global Fund. So I want to talk about three things. Um, the first is just to make some brief remarks about data quality for the primary data collection. Then I want to talk a little bit about timing and the challenges of timing outlet surveys. And the third was some of the challenges that were posed by this reliance on the secondary data for, um, for the use indicator. So on the primary data, I think we, we learned an enormous amount. We're able to um, to put into place some really good quality assurance procedures. So we were building on the methods that were developed by ACT Watch for, um, for undertaking outlet surveys, and that ranged from sampling through to training materials through, to some extent, to analysis plans. We, so we were able to develop across all of the eight pilots, standardized questionnaires, um, a very strong set of training materials and SOPs for undertaking the outlet surveys. And the IE team members participated in most of the training um, to uh, in, at baseline and at end line in all of the eight pilots. We also developed uh, common data cleaning guidelines and analysis plans. And the contractors who were contracted to collect the outlet survey data were responsible for analysis of each survey. And then the IE team reviewed the results and did the, um, the analysis of the changes over time between baseline and end line, and then integrated the quantitative data with the qualitative um, country case study data to interpret um, and understand what was going on. In terms of challenges, I think this, uh, this issue of the timing of the outlet surveys was quite important. So what I'm showing here in three columns are the, in, well, the second column shows the months between the survey, the baseline survey, and when the first copaid drugs arrived. That was kind of our, our first indication of when the program started, was the point at which the drugs arrived in country. And so you can see a couple of interesting things here. So basically, um, Nigeria, because we used uh, an earlier ACT watch survey as the baseline, the baseline took place 15 months before the first drugs arrived in country. So that has um, some potential for biasing estimates of effect, although I think we were fairly certain that not a great deal was going on in terms of antimalarial drug supply um, in that intermittent period, particularly in the private sector. Um, Kenya took place two months after the first drugs arrived in country because they were really very quick. Um, and then if you look at the end line, we've got sort of two measures here of the duration of implementation. One is the amount of time between the arrival of the first copaid drugs and the end line survey. Um, so here you can see it was an average of about 11 months of implementation before the end line had to take place. And if you take a different measure of intensity of, of implementation, which is the months between the time there was a national IEC and behavior change campaign in place and the end line survey, it's much, much shorter. In fact, um, in two of the countries, in Madagascar and Niger, there really never was a full, um, a full national scale survey. So I think what this raises is sort of the challenges of trying to kind of plan large scale survey operations and the unpredictability of the start of an intervention when you're reliant on these complex processes, particularly processes that involve negotiation between the public and the private sectors and the global fund. So we ended up with you know, measures of, end of baseline that were, you know, on average, pretty good and uh, quite short but varied periods of implementation. The second issue that Catherine also alluded to was this issue around the household surveys. So use was one of the four outcomes that we were requested to measure. Um, but the collection of the primary household data was removed from the design uh, even before the contract was issued, actually. That wasn't an inception period design. That was sort of pre-contract. And that was because of the high cost, but also because the, the TURG um, uh, advised that that was a reasonable way of controlling controlling cost. That's despite the fact that use remained in one of the core indicators. So we knew that we were going to have to kind of rely on these existing surveys if they fit. But I would also say, as I think throughout that period, there was some ambivalence like amongst the broader range of MFM stakeholders about whether use should be measured at all and how much weight it ought to carry in that process. On the one hand, there were some constituencies that felt that um, 
you know, because it was a, it involved the private sector and their concerns about equity and access and paying for anti-malarials, that understanding who was using um, code paid an anti-malarials and in particular whether they were reaching poor people, that was very important to some constituencies. Other constituencies felt that um, uh, in such a complex intervention with a very short period of implementation, it was very unlikely that there would be changes in use. So to allocate a great deal of time and resources to measuring this would not be worthwhile. So, um, so there was that sort of those undercurrents of ambivalence about whether this was going to be a, um, a challenge or not. So in the end, we did rely on these, these secondary data, and we set some inclusion criteria. We said that in order to be eligible as a baseline, a household survey had to be undertaken no more than two years before the beginning of the program, and that the end line had to be at least six months after the arrival of the first co-paid drugs. Um, and we had appropriately timed end-line data for, uh, for five countries. Three of these were from ACT Watch and two were DHS surveys. And the, the supplement on use was completed really just before the board meeting in November 2012. And this just gives you an indication of the, the timing. So this is the sort of the months between the baseline survey and the arrival of the first uh, so the arrival of first copay drugs and the baseline survey, and between the arrival of the drugs and the endline survey. So again, quite variable periods of implementation. So as you noted, we didn't have um, household survey for all of the countries, and in fact, the two countries that were believed to be the, the fast-moving, strong implementers, which were Ghana and Kenya, there was no household survey data available that was appropriate time for either one of those. The timing was not always optimal. In some cases, the, the baseline took place really quite a long time before the program started, and in others, it was a very short period of implementation. Um, a general problem with all of these anti-malarial surveys is they only measure drug use amongst children, and uh, I think there was a lot of interest in knowing what was happening to use of quality assured ACTs in adults, and there's virtually no surveys that measure that. In fact, the only one was a, a subnational study in Tanzania that was conducted through um, the uh, ACT consortium. Not all household survey structures allow you to link where you got the drug with what drug it is. And so that's sort of that really important question, sort of were people getting ACTs through the private sector, really couldn't be answered with those, with the DHS surveys in particular. I think when you're relying on secondary data, you have so much less control over the whole process. So there's the process of adapting the questionnaire, there's the training. In the outlet surveys, we spent days training people on identification of anti-malarial drugs. And you can imagine in a DHS survey where there's one or two questions on it, the amount of effort that's spent in training people on how to ask, answer these quite difficult questions is rather, is rather more limited. And the other thing is that um, even when surveys have been done at the right time, they're not always released in a timely fashion because um, governments sometimes are, are reluctant to have findings released. That became another sort of source of unpredictability and uncertainty about whether we would have the data that we needed to measure that outcome. A third sort of feature of this use, um, use issue is that, you know, as many of you will know, in 2009, WHO recommended that antimalarial drugs be given with a parasitological diagnosis. And that led a lot of countries to, um, to focus on expanding access to ACTs. And it really did change the discourse on what is the right balance between increasing access to drugs and making sure that the drugs are going to people with parasites. Um, and uh, an AMFM was kind of launched in around the same time, so AMFM really had no emphasis at all on diagnosis, and the evaluation framework really didn't either, because that had been developed at the same time. Um, and in fact, the evaluation indicator was based on the, what was called the old Merg indicator, which is the percent of children under five with fever who received an ACT, which as diagnosis is increasing, you might actually want it to fall, so it's not obvious that increasing the percentage of kids getting an ACT is necessarily the, uh, uh, the right outcome to measure. During the course of the evaluation period, the Merg indicator was changed to the proportion of kids who receive an antimalarial who receive an ACT, and that we were able to analyze in some of the countries, but it didn't have the same sort of status in the evaluation outcomes, nor in the, um, the success benchmarks that Catherine referred to. So it became very difficult for this small number of countries for which we did have household data to really interpret those changes over time. 
So in terms of key lessons, I think we did learn some important lessons about how to make sure that um, data collection is standardized and what's needed to do that, and um, analysis methods to assure quality. I think uh, we really did recognize the challenges of mounting a big primary data collection exercise when you're constrained on the one side by epidemiology and, and logistics. You can only do surveys at certain times of the year, and you don't want to be doing drug use surveys during the dry season. Um, but at the same time, we were very dependent on country process of implementation. So the match between the outlet survey data and, uh, and, the, and the intervention itself was not always ideal. Also constrained, of course, by the, the, the deadlines for reporting to the Global Fund Board. And I think also we recognized some of the challenges and limitations of relying on secondary analysis for something that turned out in the end to be a really key outcome and something that was really quite decisive in, in the final decision. And in fact, the, the, the TURG report on the evaluation points out the absence of evidence on use. Uh, so that, um, that I think um, the pieces don't all link up all that well there. So just also to conclude by acknowledging our partners from ICF Macro and, uh, and our country partners and the funders of the evaluation. Thanks. John? <laughs> Thank you, Cara. Um, what I'd like to do is go back to um, no slides uh, and talk a little bit about the PMI evaluation. And just to r remind people who didn't get a chance to read the summary, there were five objectives. One was a management review um, of the program management on their use of resources on some leadership issues that they were interested in some information on and on the quality of their program management. The second objective was to evaluate the program practices of actually getting the technical package of interventions out to the focus countries. It had information on the effect of that work on strengthening national health systems, um, the role of country ownership, and the collaboration with other partners within countries. So that second objective had four pieces, and it's quite complex. And I'm doing this because these are the different nails, and I'm going to talk about the hammers that we use to get at the different nails. The third objective um, was to evaluate the partner environment, really at a global um, level, um, to answer the question that PMI was asking itself, which was, are we in the right niche given the importance of the global fund, given other bilaterals? DFID in the British aid program was growing, and it's that positioning in a global space. Um, the fourth one is sort of the classic program evaluation, which was, are we having any impact? And we'll talk about that nail and what hammers we use to try and get at that nail. And then the fifth objective, um, which is not a data one, was to make actionable recommendations. And there was a strong emphasis on actionable uh, recommendations rather than um, just tell us what we're doing well or tell us what we're doing poorly. So within those five objectives, we had a number of different sort of nails that we had to hammer, and we used different approaches or techniques or different types of data for that. So it's a bit of a complex matrix to talk about um, data availability, data accessibility, and data quality, which are the three themes. Because clearly on objective one, that's a qualitative management review exercise. There was very little hard empiricism that, you know, that was the key informant in interviews with the stakeholders. Um, and in that case, we can talk about access. Everybody was accessible. They, they had asked for this. Um, but the one sort of comment I'll make on objective one, because I want to focus on the other ones with my time, is that what we found was most valuable in doing the management review of understanding PMI's effectiveness on the global malaria stage was not talking to Tim Zimmer and Bernard and the key people. They're smart. Bernard's here. Um, um, it was actually talking to the Global Fund people, the World Bank people. It was about talking to the others about them. It was actually much more informative <laughs> than talking to them in some ways. Um, and, um, and in fact, in this particular case, uh, they were more generous on the leadership team than the leadership team was on itself, interestingly enough. And that an interesting perspective um, to sort of get on that. So for objective one, it was really primary data collection, very much qualitative with key informant interviews. And what we spent a lot of time on was talking not to them, but talking to the people who um, benefited from them, both at a country level, at a regional level, and then also at the global level and whatnot. 
Objective two, which was to actually try to get at what the program was doing, um, was really the strength of the mixed methods approach because there, there um, was the need to sort of look at both quantitative data about the key interventions, um, but then also some qualitative data about how do you actually measure strengthening health systems or capacity strengthening within national malaria control programs. Um, and in the sort of second um, um, domain, um, this is where program-based information from the donors and from particularly the Global Fund was particularly useful to a point. And it is, we know how many nets were purchased, right? We know how many drugs were bought. We know nothing really about distribution. Uh, we know nothing really about consumption. Um, so, you know, in a lot of this work, you know, it's really the plausibility thing. You know, if it waddles, if it quacks, and if water rucks, wa runs off its back, do we really believe it's a duck? Um, and in fact, you know, we could show that, in fact, um, the commodity purchases that were part of the global scale up were happening. Could we actually track them like AMFM was trying to do on actual utilization of point of service delivery? No, we knew what was in the country. What we didn't know was how much slipped out the back door of the warehouse. Um, what we didn't know was um, whether it was used on the appropriate populations of target children, women, reproductive, um, you, know, there, you know. So there's, I got no idea who's under the nets, really. I know how many nets were in the country at any point in time. Much more difficult to get at strengthening health systems and strengthening national um, malaria control, again, using key informant interview stuff, um, but there's a tremendous respondent bias in all that stuff. There's clearly a right answer on those questions, uh, and we would hear the right answer often, um, and then have to really probe and work, not in a, in a, in a disrespectful way, but the importance of healthy skepticism um, within the evaluation team, and how we as evaluators manage what um, I call healthy skepticism um, is a big part of it. Um, what I'd like to do, um, talk a little bit about um, the impact evaluation. Did this make any difference? Because I think that's really the core um, objective of, of the evaluation. And, you know, full disclosure, the five countries that we did in-depth studies were picked in part because they had better data than the other 10 countries. And better data was defined as at least two, and in some cases, three data points uh, on change in all-cause child mortality. We did not have a direct measure of malaria-associated um, deaths averted, um, so we used the all-cause child mortality uh, as a proxy for that, malaria being a big part of that pattern of death. But again, it's a plausibility argument. We're back to our duck. I can tell you that child deaths went down. I can't necessarily tell you that those deaths that were averted were, in fact, malaria deaths were inverted. Um, but I will tell you, RDTs were there, ACTs were there, nets were there, houses were sprayed. The national program had tires on its trucks and, you know, was moving around the country and doing stuff. But um, we, um, the quality of death-specific or cost-specific death data, as we all know, is pretty poor. Um, so. You know, we, we were able, much like the AFM, the Affordable Facilities um, Group, to use the large global DHS mix malaria indication, indicator survey as our primary secondary data source um, for that all-cause mortality reduction. And we know both the strengths and the weaknesses of those data and how they're constructed and whatnot, but they're, um, I would say, in general, they're pretty good. And um, they are um, also remarkably good relative to, and that's the, the next point that I'd like to make, because program data is pretty good, use of the big surveys is pretty good, and the national level data was deeply problematic. We had hoped to use routine information system data in the countries that we visited to, uh, much more than in fact we were um, able to do. Um, we started to code data as PDG, which is pretty damn good, versus dyno data, 
um, which we called data in name only. Um, and that was our um, way to sort of code some of this stuff. And there's a lot of data in name only that we just need to acknowledge is part of it. And it sometimes does get rolled up into the national stuff, which is deeply um, problematic. In terms of um, access issues, um, the, the issue of access for the primary data collection was really not a problem. Everybody agreed to talk to us. One exception, a quick phone call to Washington, that got fixed too. Um, but in general, the, the access issues, um, and they somewhat relate to quality issues, is somewhat different, um, and it's really at the country level. And I'm gonna highlight three pieces of our experience. One, the national program personnel clearly have sovereignty issues with their data. Fair enough. But the real issue was not over the raw data. The issue was over the analysis and interpretation. And this goes back to an issue that Carmela raised this morning about the lack of national capacity. If we think it's weak on just doing surveys, it's even weaker on analyzing and interpreting surveys. And as one African colleague said to me, you know, you're no different than the, the mineral companies. You come, you extract our ore, you process it, and you sell it back to us at much higher value added. And I thought it was a wonderful sort of image for what in fact, you know, we said, well, fine, if you don't have it analyzed, give us the raw data. You know, I got, I got graduate students. I, I can get this stuff whipped into shape. And they were not very keen to have their data whipped into shape, even though it might have added value to them in their own program and whatnot. It was, it was really um, both, in some cases, an embarrassment that they had raw data that had never been cleaned or analyzed. In other cases, it was just, you know, we don't want to be surprised by what our own data says. We have a political agenda on malaria in this country, and we're afraid um, that, in fact, it may not be um, as good as is happening. The second anecdote I'll say is that there are, in the malaria world, there's a lot of players, and some of them are very large. And um, we tried very diligently to speak to the other players because we were tasked to look at the role of PMI in relation to the other players. And some of the big philanthropic initiatives, um, which had generated a lot of data, were quite willing to have their data core guy talk to us but we're never interested in letting us actually put fingers on data. So do I believe the Masepa data for Zambia? Mm, yeah, sometimes, good days. Um, but do I, did I have any independent ability to review that data, to fully understand the data dictionary, how it was constructed, this, that, and the other thing? No, um, I don't. Uh, and, you know, though within the national plans you can get commodity purchase data, we know what the Japanese bought, we know what the Brits bought, we know what the Americans bought, we know what the Global Fund grants allowed to be purchased. So we can get some of that data together, but at the national level and the philanthropic organizational level, um, there were um, problems with accessibility to data. So it wasn't, it wasn't always easy to get full access. Um, I think what I'll do is um, sort of I'll, I'll close on the issue of, you know, part of our complexity is um, by actually realizing that we have to do multiple things, sometimes primary data collection with, with individual interviews. Sometimes we need to use those large global databases that are the large household surveys and hope that the timing aligns and if not, sort of tweak them to the best we can in our pl plausibility argument. We have to deal with national sovereignty issues. We have to deal with the difference between data and knowledge, which knowledge to me is data that has been uh, cleaned, analyzed, and interpreted. Um, raw data in and of itself does not generate knowledge. Um, so there's a lot of tricky things around the data environment, and at the end of the day, for the kinds of things we were doing, and if you read that evaluation show, you'll realize we had a much shorter time frame and much less money than the three other large evaluations we're talking about. Um, you're really in the realm of can you make a believable, plausible argument that associates the investments made by the global community and the national governments to minimize the impact of malaria to the activities um, that we were able to show um, did occur in terms of commodity, in terms of training, in terms of 
uh, accessibility um, uh, at health systems. And, you know, it's a leap of faith. And I think a lot of this evaluation work requires um, a healthy skepticism and then at the end of the day, everybody to sort of decide just how far of a leap are they willing to make. Thanks. Thank you, John. So, uh, Bajet, let's hear from you about the routine okay. program data, <laughs> pros and cons. Okay, so oh, I'm going to shift gears um, and and direct my comments primarily to implementing partners. So I think many, hopefully many are on the webcast. I think fewer are, are in this room, but to really speak about the nuts and bolts of using routinely collected data and publicly available data for program evaluation. I'm going to draw on ICAP's experience as a, a large PEPFAR implementing partner. Um, that supported the scale up of HIV services in about 20 countries over the past eight years. Um, let's see, how do I, why are we all having trouble with this? Just left click. There we go. Okay, so specifically I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges in using data from even the most rudimentary data sources. So here you see a very early pre-art um, register that was developed by hand pre-WHO um, um, monitoring guidelines in South Africa to address important questions about the scale up of HIV services. So these questions include, they're not ones of impact per se that we've been largely focused on, but rather ones about outcomes and include, for example, um, whether the availability of adherence support and outreach services are associated with patient attrition, whether there's spillover of HIV scale-up such that the availability of care and treatment services are associated with increased use of ANC services among HIV-negative women, whether specific program characteristics and the community and, the, and attributes of the communities in which the health facilities are located are associated with more timely initiation of treatment, and whether outcomes of children enrolled at primary health care facilities, outcomes of children enrolled in HIV care at primary health facilities are comparable to those enrolled at higher level facilities. So at ICAP, we've worked very hard to bridge the divide between monitoring and evaluation. And while we do do um, a fair number of focused evaluations and research studies using primary data collections or experimental or quasi-experimental designs, our key eva evaluation framework is based on routinely collected data and publicly available data. And we regularly use four data sources so shown here. So on a quarterly basis, we collect aggregate indicator data. And by that, I mean service statistics, or um, in our case, PEPFAR next generation indicators. Um, these are shown, you can see some examples on the right, so the number of patients enrolled in HIV care, the number died, lost follow-up or transferred, and then some information on successive cohorts of patients initiating ART. We have these data um, from over 3,000 health facilities collected over an eight-year period um, and that reflect over 1.6 million patients enrolled in HIV care. In some countries, um, the majority of patients on ART are enrolled at facilities, uh, PEPFAR-supported facilities that are receive technical assistance from ICAP. And so in those countries, I would say that these data are probably the most generalizable that you can get in terms of speaking about a program. Um, at a subset of facilities that provide care and treatment uh, services, patient level clinical data are increasingly electronized, either for patient management or to support routine reporting, which has become cumbersome to do by hand. We've obtained an IRB approval to, uh, to get on a quarterly basis a de-identified, basically a data dump every quarter from each of those clinics and house them in a standardized data warehouse where they can then be used for program evaluation. So some of the examples of, of those data are de demographics at enrollment into HIV care, point of entry, uh, disease stage at entry into HIV care, and fo uh, follow-up visits, as well as art status. And right now we have data from over 300 health facilities on nearly 1 million patients. On an annual basis, we also undertake facility surveys to better understand the infrastructure and programmatic features of some of, of, of the services in care and treatment clinics and laboratories that we support. We've just completed our seventh round of data collection in this case, and you can see here again some of the data. So 
from the mo more basic, where is the facility located, to what are the clinic hours, do they charge fees for certain types of tests, and what ancillary services or staffing configurations do they have. We also, um, and, and I know, you know not all implementing par partners connect conduct such surveys, but there are some publicly available, available facility survey data, such as those generated by macro service provision assessment. Um, that I think can be harnessed and used in the context of program evaluation. Finally, we access um, publicly available data, not service-based, but community-based, so that, that comes from DHS or, or the census, um, and, and map them at the subnational level to the regions in which are the health facilities that we support are located. So with these data in mind, our evaluation framework seeks to address two primary questions shown here, to examine the variation in HIV care and treatment outcomes by site and determine the extent to which facility and community level, level factors are associated with those outcomes. This framework obviously recognizes that there's a substantial variation in the way HIV programs are scaled up, both within and between countries, and takes advantage of this natural variation to identify which approaches are optimal by using largely hierarchical modeling. So as is commonly the case when using routinely collected data, we've had a we've had to contend with data quality issues. We've addressed this by conducting data quality assurances at multiple levels. So first at the facility level, at least annually, where we assess completeness and accuracy of key elements in data so in source documents. Integrating automated data checks into our web-based reporting and management system. And then at the analysis stage, um, which is always not always so straightforward. So this example comes from a data cleaning conundrum that we're kind of grappling with right now. We're completing an analysis of um, short-term attrition in PEPFAR programs. So using a routinely collected indicator, has retention of patients on ART changed over time as scale-up has proceeded? So this slide just shows data um, from one country um, and three implementing partners shown in, in different colors. And you can see um, there were some potentially spurious values. So the partner in red basically showed that um, all of their patients were retained over time, which is somewhat curious. Um, the one in blue at the bottom showed that virtually no patients were retained over time. And the one in yellow had great fluctu uh, fluctuations from 100% retention to 0%. Attrition, uh, retention over time. So you know, parsing out whether this is data quality or reality is, is difficult because many of these sites are very small. And so these are based on cohort reporting data and cohorts may be, may have, um, may be as small as five patients. So it is possible that uh, in one quarter those five patients are retained and in the next they're not. Um, there were a lot of discussions with the various implementing partners as to what to do in this case. So suggestions range from throw away the first year of data, because that's where partner B in yellow, you know, was having uh, that we see the most fluctuation. And the other one was true, um, focus just on the larger sites. Obviously, both of these approaches introduce some biases. So ultimately, we decided to remove specific data points only if the partners could provide very detailed documentation. Um, and justifiable documentation as to why these values could be considered data, uh, poor data quality. Um, even when implementing partners work hard to ensure data quality, one thing that, that we found ourselves and, and have worked around is that ME systems are often not set up to facilitate analysis. So in order to ensure that we could regularly merge and use our data, we integrated what I think are very minor um, but ultimately critical pieces of information in our web-based reporting system, such as integrating unique site IDs to facilitate merging of data across programmatic areas, care and treatment and PMTCT, for example, including geo-coordinates to allow merging of routinely collected data with publicly available data, such as the DHS. Um, we've also set up our m and &E system so that we can easily export a standardized analytic file with, along with a standardized data dictionary and thus minimize the need for data managers or programmers to create analysis files. 
Finally, we've tried to address the tricky issues around ownership. I wouldn't uh, data ownership. I wouldn't say we're 100% uh, uh, successful, but early on we established principles of collaboration with each of the host governments for our evaluation frameworks, and these speak to IRB approvals, the scope of the analyses, use of data in multi-country analyses, which I think has been quite an interesting one because each of the countries you know, focus on on their own specific issues. But what we're um, most interested in is what happens when you pool all the data across countries, um, data accessibility issues and authorship issues. So just in conclusion, I do believe that despite all the um, uh, challenges of using routinely collected program and data, um, I do think particularly when combined with publicly available data that there are rich, highly underutilized and often the most generalizable and efficient source of information for program evaluation. When merged together, obviously these data become much more powerful and lend themselves to multi-level analyses. We, we need to continuously assess data quality at all phases of program evaluation or monitoring and evaluation, so data collection, management and analysis. And implementing partners need to do more work to ensure that their ME systems um, facilitate data use for analysis. And these include, in, uh, focus on, on what I've listed here, some very small but essential um, uh, modifications that need to be made for, um, to ME systems. And then it's obviously important to establish infrastructures for analysis at Project START. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bhatia. So next we'll have Victoria shifting gears a bit to talk about financial data. Um. Um, my slides? Um, okay. Great, so good afternoon everyone. Uh, all protocols observed. Um, I've been asked to speak about uh, financial data. And as uh, I think Bridget mentioned in the notes, the data and the methods used must be, quote, fit for purpose. So the purpose of financial data, I think, differs from that of programmatic data, but the two are sort of like two sides of a coin. So while programmatic data is used to assess the effectiveness of activities, I think financial data helps us to assess the efficiency and the value for money uh, of our investments. And it provides this crucial denominator of just how much value or good was achieved for every pound, pula, or peso. And ensuring good value for money is an essential task of every so-called global health initiative. And in my view, a, a GHI, Global Health Initiative, is fundamentally a global health funding agency or funder. And in the language of health economics, it's a, it's a payer of health services and with it all the corresponding roles and responsibilities of a payer. So the value for money of various global health funding agencies uh, was the focus of our report. And ultimately, we chose to, to focus on the Global Fund. As, as seen here, this is the cover of our, our, of our report. And we focus on the Global Fund as well as its key partners. And uh, this, the report cover shows our, our four domain framework from uh, allocations to contracts, cost and spending, performance uh, verification. And I think this, contract, this uh, framework could be applied to a variety of, uh, of fun funders, not only the Global Fund. Um, it, yeah. So there are a whole variety of kinds of financial data, and I've, I was asked to use illustrative examples and only have four slides, that was the, the, pres the prescription. Um, so I'm gonna focus on two types of data today. The first is on planned expenditures or budgets, and the, the, the other is actual expenditures and costs. And so I'll speak briefly about the availability and accessibility of these two types of data, drawing on illustrations from the Global Fund and PEPFAR. So at the planning allocation stage, you know, a funder has to make at least three core decisions. You know, which countries is it going to invest in? What are the key populations? And what interventions is, is it going to invest in? So from a social planner or technocratic perspective, uh, these allocations can be optimized to maximize a particular goal, such as saving a uh, number of, of lives. So in terms of data access and availability, um, the, I think there are some, some serious challenges. So from our review of global fund data, which I do want to say that it does, the Global Fund does deserve a you know, considerable amount of praise for making some of its information transparent. But we reviewed something like 20, uh, grant, 20 countries, uh, which were the highest recipients of HIV AIDS funding from the Global Fund, and we found that something like 40% of the grants did not reveal any budget information in their country grant agreements at all. And of those that which did, uh, the, the, the data availability uh, 
uh, accessibility was highly varied. So we looked at five countries here, and you can see that in the case of India and the Philippines, uh, where uh, the epidemic is highly concentrated, the summary budgets that were re revealed rarely in indicated uh, what the key populations uh, were. So we really had very little sense of where the funding was going. And in response, I, of course, the Global Fund here can, can, can give the response, but my understanding was that they felt that the information, the, su the summary and the detailed budgets were available, but they weren't publicly accessible. Um, and in our view, we, we argued that uh, having such in information publicly accessible was quite crucial for value for money, given the large number of actors in this space. Uh, there was a great quote in the IM PEPFAR evaluation, and just to par paraphrase, it was something to the effect of, it was by a country representative. It was, if we only knew we, the country, where PEPFAR's money was going, where geographically, what interventions, uh, wouldn't we be able to complement our efforts? And so making that information publicly accessible, we, we would argue, is hugely important for getting better value for money. So the second area of financial data that I'd like to speak briefly about is about actual expenditures and costs. So the Global Fund spends about 40% of its funding on commodities. And we think it should be commend, commended for its groundbreaking price and quality reporting system, which reveals the prices and quantities of six main drugs and commodities. So this, this figure here, shows uh, the prices obtained um, for a number of countries for a uh, price per patient year for Bertanivir, and you can see huge variations in this. And uh, the Global Fund also makes its uh, future funding conditional uh, for the countries. Um, basically, countries need to report the prices that they, they obtain for their drugs in order to ensure uh, future funding. So they sort of condition future funding based on reporting to the system. And the system was hugely important for um, kind of being a groundbreaker among funding agencies for cr um, compiling this extremely valuable um, price uh, information on these commodities. And I think the Global Fund is continuing to expand the scope of these uh, commodities as well. And so I think in terms of the availability and accessibility, this is a huge uh, success story. Um, but in terms of, you know, although the, the Global Fund has done per quite well, I think, with the PQR, I think there, there is one area in which um, we, need, we do need a lot more work, and that's in the area of measuring unit costs. And here I think this is where PEPFAR has actually done a terrific job, although it's still in the early stages. So collecting such data on unit costs is, is not easy. It involves facility surveys, multiple um, types of checks. Um, but this is an example from their pilot expenditure analysis uh, uh, study in Mozambique um, for PEPFAR. And you can see in 2009, uh, there was a huge range in the um, uh, non-ARV unit expenditure per patient year. And then they collected that information, they showed it to the countries themselves, and then two years later they revealed that not only did the range, uh, the average seemed to be uh, decreasing, um, but also the range had major decreases as well. So I think this is, this is a huge area for uh, enhancing value for money. Uh, one that I think um, both the Global Fund and, and PEPFAR should, should not neglect in the, in the future. Um, but just to conclude, I think the financial data both are quite varied in their accessibility, um, availability, um, and, and quality. But I, I'm, overall, I'm confident that all of these actors will you know, improve in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And last but certainly not least, we have Peter Elias, who's from the University of Warwick. Well, good afternoon. And Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm down to talk about financial data, and I'm not going to talk about financial data. Uh, I have over the years, I'm a social scientist, and I have over the years been engaged in a lot of program evaluation, mainly in the sort of social and economic sphere. And I'm not going to talk about that, uh, because I don't do that work anymore, for many of the reasons that Elliot outlined this morning. Uh, I became very dissatisfied with the quality of data that was available um, with the uh, specification of evaluation programs and evaluation techniques particularly, and the lack of any kind of long-term approach to evaluation, which uh, I think uh, left us in a very uh, sad and sorry state here in the UK. I've not undertaken any research in the last 10 years, so I'm not going to talk about research. Um, I've devoted that time to the development of large-scale uh, data infrastructure for research purposes uh, here in the UK 
Uh, and we've been, I think, very successful in that respect with the world's largest household panel study, uh, the world's largest birth cohort study, uh, bigger than the National Children's Study in the US, um, and with many other initiatives uh, most recently, uh, and initiatives which will see uh, us gain uh, a really important ability to link between a wide variety of administrative data sets and our national health survey data. And that's going to prove to be an enormous asset for, for the future. But I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is some work that started back in 2004. Now, at that time, um, the UK Economic and Social Research Council and uh, the social and behavioural sciences people at NSF um, met to discuss how they might promote a more international research agenda in the social, behavioural and economic sciences. And, and I think the relevance of this is that much of what we have to say in that area has got a lot of relevance for the public health agenda and for work in the medical sciences, especially in the uh, epidemiological area. They commissioned the New York Social Research Council to write a report, which they did very quickly, and that was quite an influential report. And it said, basically, if you want to promote a more international research agenda, you've got to sort the data out, because it's a dreadful mess there are some purpose-built surveys out there which people use and use a lot, and uh, DHS, of course, is one of those. But that's really quite limited, and there's great problems of data access, data discovery, data access, data availability, uh, metadata, making data usable for research in ways that would lead to good comparative research. And so a couple of years later, we'd uh, set up um, a big conference we ran in Beijing, Martin was there. Uh, we called it the International Data Forum. And lots of countries were there, lots of people made great presentations, and we all agreed, yes, we needed to do something, and this International Data Forum was a good idea. Well, uh, as international uh, arrangements go, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, uh, we then spent the next four years discussing how might it be funded, uh, where would it be located? Um, who was going to take charge of it? Um, what would its terms of reference be? What would its agenda be? Um, do we really need another international body, or can this work be incorporated in some existing international structure? And it looked like all the steam had gone out of this initiative, until we took it to the OECD. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about, is the work we then did within the OECD, because quite rightly the OECD said, you have to make a case for this. You've got to go out there and show us what the landscape looks like. So let me see if I can figure out how to do this. We set up an expert group. Those are the countries uh, that are represented, and in terms of uh, social sciences, there's some big names in there, particularly on the, the, the data side. From the US, Myron Gutman, of course, had been very uh, heavily involved in um, the, the Michigan uh, uh, data initiative um, and, of course, uh, took over at the NSF until recently. And people like Julia Lane, who had uh, been engaged with NORC and the developments of the uh, local, um, the, the linked employer-employee database. Um, so uh, a lot of really uh, knowledgeable people came together. What we decided to do was to take what we called a science-driven approach to the global uh, social science data agenda. Uh, we needed to know what were the problems, we needed to know what was already happening, what was going on, what could we build on, um, and from that to work out what needs to be done and then to put some recommendations together with ways in which those recommendations were taken forward. So that effectively were the terms of reference for this expert group. We decided at quite an early stage to have much more of a focus on what you might call uh, born digital data, data which perhaps weren't designed for research but have got research value if they can be made available, if they were discoverable, if they were usable, if they were fit for purpose. And of course a lot of that uh, is, uh, well, census and survey records of course we know about, but administrative records, records of transactions, communications, internet activity, uh, and of course lots of uh, digitised information 
is now available but is not particularly usable. What do we mean by a science-driven approach? And this is just a list of a few of the problems that we want to address using this kind of approach. Um, migration, of course, is, is a huge issue. There are great public health issues associated with migration, but enormous social issues and political issues as well. Climate change, which uh, is affecting many countries now in ways which are highly unpredictable. Uh, public health risks, particularly associated with um, uh, uh, communicable diseases. Uh, we've had a number of scares now, uh, and we know there will be more, and how well are we prepared, and what kind of data are we going to use to help address uh, the issues that will arise. Um, Ageing populations, of course we know about this, and efforts that we make to alleviate poverty, which are so critically associated with uh, the development of uh, health and well-being of populations. So, why do we want to do this? Well, we've got to make a case for the benefits that will arise from better access and sharing of data of various kinds. Well, of course, we want to engage in comparative work because there are very big differences between nations in terms of what they do and how they do it. And taking advantage of that natural variation is hugely important. Also, the larger our data sets, the more we have an ability to study rare groups uh, and occurrences or combinations of characteristics. It's clear to us that national boundaries are losing their relevance as boundaries of human behavior, not just because of large-scale migration, but because of the way we communicate, interact, uh, and move, and trade. We also have met much more what we call multinational commercial entities who are data providers. We need to know how they are creating data. A lot of the data that we get from internet search activity, it's directly comparable because it's all collected by the same methods, uh, except of course we have to appreciate uh, the language and the culture that has uh, generated it. But research collaborations, as we know, they are extending across national boundaries and people want to gain access to each other's data. Uh, and simply, uh, there's a statistical issue about inference improving as the number of diversity of countries increases. So these are very strong and powerful arguments for better international data access and better data sharing. What are the issues we want to address? Well, discovering data. You can't even begin if you don't know where to find data and how to start looking and where to look and how to phrase what you're looking for. And it's interesting when you talk to research students nowadays about the methods that they use for data discovery, there's one word that just comes out all the time, Google. Is that sufficient? I think not, quite honestly. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, it's very difficult to move people away from, well, I've done a Google search and I've found this, so I'm going out to collect my own data now because there isn't any. Uh, and that's just not appropriate. <coughs> New forms of data. Um, they've got research value. We know that. Uh, we've seen it uh, simply in terms of um, Google flu trends, for example, uh, and, and other ways in which uh, information which previously people didn't think of as having any research value is shown to have strong research value. And it's not just internet-based activity. A lot of information, whether it's from uh, store loyalty cards, for example, for the big food chains, gives us tremendous amounts of information about, about uh, calorie intakes, about diet structures and so on, which can be linked to other kinds of data which can really help to inform um, a uh, uh, public health agenda in that area. Um, and, and it's the case also that it's getting increasingly expensive to rely on the more traditional methods of data collection. That is to go out there and locate people and interview them and have some kind of population frame that you can relate that to so you can then infer from the sample that you have something about the population. Simply having population data is often not, not available. Uh, we have great problems now of response rates to uh, inquiries, we have all kinds of biases that creep in, and essentially the survey methodology that we know and love uh, is getting weaker and weaker 
through time. We have to have other ways in which we can create and or enhance such data. Access issues. Have people given consent that their data can be used for research? And if not, is it ethical for us to do that? Now, this is a real problem that we're grappling with across the European Union at the moment, and one that the Wellcome Trust has been very heavily involved in, together with other funding agencies, because we seem to be moving towards uh, a new kind of law for the European Union, which will cause us to seek consent for our research. And basically, we cannot have that, because it's impractical, it's costly, uh, it will lead to very strongly biased results and so on. And so uh, we are all resisting this very, very heavily. But it does raise issues. If a law has arisen across 27 countries, or is in the process of being written across 27 countries, there must be some underlying public um, disquiet, dissatisfaction with the way in which we as researchers are using their data at the moment. And we have to address that issue. We have to protect and secure data. We have to have very good governance arrangements for uh, data if we're going to proceed as we want to, often without the consent of data subjects. Um, and this, rises, this gives rise to all kinds of problems of data sharing, legal problems, uh, jurisdictional problems. Problems of comparability have been mentioned. Um, as Martin said, it's essential that we're all singing from the same song sheet when we're talking about concepts and variables and values and so on. And there are plenty of international classifications out there that we should use, but so often they're not used. And if there isn't an international classification, we ought to make sure that there is. We ought to have ways in which we can collaborate to define what it is we're studying in ways that will enable us to share that information. Equally, it's about having good metadata, data that describe data. Sometimes we call it paradata as well, data about how data were provided and collected. It's quite important that we should know what it is that we're using. Data preservation and sustainability. How often is it the case that we see studies done, but you can't find where those data have been lodged? Who's got the information? Who's got responsibility for preserving it? How long will they preserve it for? Is it just sitting around on some hard drive or some DVDs somewhere? Uh, will it get thrown away 10 years from now? Or will it go into a managed system that will preserve it? And we are beginning to wake up to the fact that a lot of our data preservation and management systems are inadequate for the modern age with the deluge of data which is now upon us. But what's going on? Well, there's plenty going on. Um, the European Union funds the Council of European Social Science Data Archives, and they're doing quite a bit now to try to integrate across uh, large data archives in many countries. There's programs like Data Without Boundaries. Lots of organizations at the international level uh, fund or even themselves undertake work where data are being made uh, available in ways which are uh, usable for comparative research. But is it enough? We made some recommendations in this report, and their recommendations are tailored, if you like, for these different audiences. I'm going to go through these very quickly because there's a reference to the report at the end. Um, but basically, we would like to see more funding of research to explore the potential of new forms of data. We want more cooperation between official statistical providers, often national statistical agencies, and research communities. In some countries, that hardly exists at all, which is quite incredible. We need to have better coordination of data management plans so that we know more about data before they are created, and these are discoverable objects. Uh, we need to ensure that the international organizations are a little bit more connected. Uh, we did some work talking to WHO, talking to the ILO, uh, talking to World Bank, uh, and so on. And we find out, well, internally, they've got great schemes and projects on the go to do things, but they didn't know about what each other were doing, which, uh, again, we found uh, a little bit disturbing. Um, there needs, of course, to be more incentives for international sharing of data. There needs to be ways in which those people who take responsibility for the development of these resources are rewarded for that effort. 
Of course, they're not writing papers. So how are they going to be rewarded? So we need to look at the way in which, particularly in an academic setting, we, we give rewards via promotion uh, for, often, uh, publication. Um, again, that needs to be re-examined. That's the report we've produced. I commend that to you. It's short. It's highly readable. Where do we go from here? Is it a report to sit on a shelf? Uh, clearly, we don't want that. And we're making a lot of effort now. That is myself and um, Barbara Entwistle, who's the, um, the Vice Chancellor of Research at uh, University of North Carolina, uh, are making efforts to promote the recommendations. And what we've decided to do is to take a, a kind of um, eclectic approach to this. So we approach the European Union uh, with ideas. We've approached the OECD with further follow-on work that could, should be undertaken. We've approached a group of funding agencies from uh, six countries, Canada, uh, the USA, Germany, France, Netherlands, and the UK, uh, to get uh, programs of action across those six countries. Um, and we've uh, engaged with programs now. There's one called the Transatlantic Platform, which brings in those countries I just mentioned, plus uh, Mexico and Brazil, ways in which we can look at these recommendations and start taking things forward. There's a lot of really good work to build on. There's a lot of work happening in different disciplinary areas, and we only have to look at uh, organisations like CERN uh, or the work of uh, at EMBL and Elixir and programmes like this to know that there's a tremendous amount of expertise out there about um, developing data resources and about sharing that information. But we've got to join it together. And equally, we've got to bring up those countries which are much more uh, uh, or much less engaged with these sorts of initiatives to, to bring them forward and to find ways in which we can help them to fund activities associated with better data access and better data sharing. Thank you. Well, uh, round for the panelists, please. Well, I think we've, we've covered some um, interest or uncovered some interesting things that are somewhat consistent across the, the panelists. Uh, certainly questions around data access before, during, and after evaluations are done uh, are issues. Data quality, uh, accessibility, availability um, are, are a consistent uh, theme. The whole goal of turning information into knowledge, raw data into actually usable and applied um, uh, information is, is critical. And a lot of discussion around capacity building. So Martin talked about the importance of defining indicators um, and cautioning us uh, again that you know we can't roll up poor data um, into a higher level um, compositional data. Kara pointed out the, the key to uh, standardizing data collection when one is doing uh, primary data capture analysis um, and the difficulties but potential utility of using secondary data sources um, in, in one's evaluation. John uh, talked about several data nails and the need for specific hammers um, to fit the, the, the data need. Um, he came up with some rather interesting data codes that we might or might not use in our own future work uh, and talked really, I think, uh, carefully and thoughtfully about the data sovereignty issues, which are um, important um, and, and were touched on by others as well. Batya, I think, made a strong case for the utility of routine program data use um, when it obviously is carefully collected and, and quality assured, which uh, she gave clear examples of. And the importance of principles of collaboration around data access and use, which, uh, you know, I wonder how widely promulgated these principles are and how often we have really um, a priori uh, incorporated those into our own evaluations at large and small scale. Um, Victoria uh, really, I thought, uh, brought the important point forward of the critical need to have financial data. Some of the same issues as with program data around uh, access and transparency, um, but that this is a really critical part of evaluation, understanding not just program effect, but also value for investment. And that is in increasingly uh, a call that I think we all have to heed as resources get more and more constrained for the increasing work that we all want to do to improve population health. Um, interesting to sh see the wide variability in the unit costs and how important that information can be towards not just driving down costs, but perhaps coming up with more efficient models 
of delivery, of program delivery. Um, Peter, I think, very refreshingly gave us a truly big global picture around uh, data issues and, and global trends. Uh, the need to, to have more effort to make data available, again, as, as we've discussed, um, in, in order to, to make uh, comparative research uh, more consistently uh, done. So I think those are just some of the, the key uh, pieces that I just picked off very quickly and, and uh, glancingly. I wrote down four or five questions that, that I'd love to have the panel discuss, but in the interest of time, I want you all to bring forward your questions. If necessary, we can probably dip into our 4 to 4.30 break. Um, to cover some of the Q&A uh, time, if everyone's okay with that. But let's go ahead and bring forward some questions from the audience. And please say your name and where you're from. Hello, my name is Kristen Stelgis. I'm with the Hewlett Foundation in the US. And I had a question for Peter. Um, you didn't mention any African governments or institutions and the people that you were talking with. So I was curious, if you have been talking with them and if there's been any issues around data sovereignty that John was talking about. And also to Batya, when you're talking about some of these data quality issues with existing data sources, are you, is there any work that you're doing to help these different people and clinics collect the data? What have you found if you've been working on that that's successful or have you just been working with the data once it's already been collected? Um, Should I start with an answer? Peter, let's start with the but very quickly. Um, uh, yes. Um, in the follow-up work that we're proposing, South Africa have expressed a very strong interest in joining uh, the group that conducts any follow-up work. Um, so we're already talking to uh, the um, National um, uh, Research Funding uh, Agency in, in South Africa and also various research groups who have got some very interesting and good uh, re research databases available. Um, more generally, um, we want to promote uh, a lot of our recommendations and our work across a number of African countries. And there's a workshop here in about a couple of weeks' time, which will be an opportunity to start those discussions. But we have a long way to go. I think we recognize, because it's OECD, it's kind of problematic. You're starting with the rich man's club. Um, and, and it's not surprising, therefore, that we end up with a, a lot of recommendations which are doable for that group of countries and a few others that were included, like Brazil and India, um, but remain absolutely out of reach for many other countries because of a lack of resources, a lack of knowledge, a lack of expertise. Uh, and that's a real problem that we have to address. Just to respond quickly, um, so as a PEPFAR implementing partner, we uh, support the health facilities to collect data, and that's increasingly the case as PEPFAR has moved to a transition phase. Um, uh, there are, uh, we certainly face the problem of you know, people don't want to collect data and they don't see the utility, they don't always see the utility of it. Um, one of the things we've done that's that's been, I'd say, somewhat successful in that area is regularly conducting data review meetings, um, whether they occur at a district level or e even at a lower level than that, and have each health facility present their own data. Um, in terms of working with the health facility staff to conduct data quality assurance exercises, everything is very streamlined. We've developed Excel spreadsheets where they input the data, it spits out tables for them on completeness and accuracy that are color coded so they know when, you know, when there's a problematic uh, indicator or not. And, um, and so we make those tools available to the facility staff. Hi, I have a question which I'm not sure um, should be answered now or maybe in the rest of the conference will emerge some more, but I felt in this panel um, some of the uncomfortable political economic sides to this whole topic um, were emerging. Um, and I, I wonder, especially in John's presentation, also in Peter's presentation, um, could you say a little bit more about where it really becomes uncomfortable? Um, in Peter's presentation, I, I was looking at the internet quickly while you were talking. I mean, you have been on this topic now for a couple of years. How fast is it moving? Uh, what obstacles are actually encountering in, in reality? Before you answer, so could you just you say, say your name? And the so, yeah, I introduced myself this morning. Gorlieve van Heetren, uh, Rotterdam Global Health Initiative. Thank you. Erasmus University. Politics uh, is hugely important. and. Uh, 
it, it often stands very much in the way, sometimes to the point where uh, it, it's difficult indeed to, to, to know how to interact. We certainly had that, uh, we've had those discussions with the Chinese authorities, for example, where at one point you'll suddenly find this great access and great cooperation, and then suddenly the barrier comes down and you can't do something or you can't publish something or you can't take any data away um, or you can't bring in people who you want to bring in to, to do bits of work or you have a very good idea and it just uh, hits a brick wall. Um, it, it's very difficult indeed. Other countries, of course, it's completely the opposite. I think Brazil, I thought, was so refreshing in terms of the work they've done, the transparency, the way in which they've uh, linked their researchers and their data and their projects through the Lattice database um, <laughs> to the point where I asked for some information on um, uh, linked employer-employee data. And the next day, um, two DVDs arrived. And they said, well, on here, you've got to about uh, 35 million records of employees. Um, we didn't take the names and addresses off, but you won't really need to use that, will you? And we were absolutely aghast uh, that such data could be handed out so freely. So yes, I mean, there are, there are great problems here. Um, sometimes it works to advantage, uh, often not. Um. What are the points of uncomfortableness and what predicts them is an interesting question. Um, you know, in Zambia, where we've been working for 12 years, we have much less um, points of uncomfortableness with our colleagues than in one of the other countries where we didn't have the kind of depth and history and professional network with members of the scientific community. So level one is, who do you know? Um, level two um, is, in general, none of these are absolutely, but they're general comments, um, scientists are more willing to share data than science managers, particularly governmental science managers. Um, so again, it's who you're asking for the data from and who actually has access to it. And you know, in general, government people have proven to be a little more reticent than colleagues within the scientific community who potentially see some value added of getting some additional information or analyses done. And then the third variable I'd say is country sensitivity. South Africa is more sensitive. India is more sensitive. Uh, Zambia may be less sensitive. You know, I mean, there's just some, some, some country variability which, um, you know, we could probably, with the collected experience in this room, sort of go back to, you know, a typology of data sensitivity, Brazil clearly would be at one end of the spectrum um, from some of, uh, some of the South Africans' concerns about data and whatnot. And I guess the last thing is type of data. Um, in general, the Zambians are quite open unless it's biologic information. And they have a real sensitivity around um, biologic stuff that um, the social science data, they're much more comfortable sharing. So there's not an easy answer. I, I give you a typology of four different things which af affect, as you called it, the points of uncomfortableness, which is a fabulous phrase. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make the point that a major distinction would be whether we be talking about comparative data or other data. Comparative data, by definition, have benefits for everybody. South Africa would have benefited from the data from Lesotho, Malawi, Swaziland, whatever, and the reverse. And basically, it has been proven for the last 30 years it's possible to, to get there, certainly with a certain kind of data, because it opens up the information to everybody, not just to one side. And it benefits all sides. Can, to follow up on that point, can you say where you've seen good examples of that done? Well, DHS is basically my example, <laughs> you know, it, it, it just because it has been so long in existence yeah. and because basically from the very beginning, and there's no merit of us, it's actually the U.S. government basically said from the beginning, this is a comparative study program, data should be available to everyone. So we actually write an agreement with a country which says after you, in the country, have had a chance to write your report, 
and publish your report so we don't take that away from you. All data are freely available to all responsible researchers. And typically, there's hardly any problems with implementing that system. But we're not trying to take away from countries the possibility to analyze our own data, which is a key thing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so. In the back, we have? Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, Deborah Rugg, uh, UN. You heard me this morning. Um, it, it it strikes me that there's uh, there's two parallel realities going on right now, and this one represents the very measured, considered. We're struggling with the ethical approach to to data, and then there's the the movement, the information movement, and it's certainly led by people under 30, and and it's already there, and it's got more than than we even know and want it to have, and and it's a train that's not stopping, and. How are you embracing that and possibly letting this um, or capitalizing on the, the, the information age and the technology and the internet and the, the Googles and the Twitters and the, this information that a, a lot of the um, companies are now using to, how do we harness that to our advantage? And I think this conversation is going to um, dramatically change, it, almost if we want it to or not, it's already changing. Um, because we all expect data, and we all expect information, and everybody's using information and data. Has, has that um, been factoring into your approach? I guess I'm looking at Peter and, and John, you've been commenting. Is that factoring into how you're seeing this? Because I, I see big changes, sea changes coming on this information accessibility uh, area, maybe more than we want. More than some of us want. Even some of us old folks act like under 30-year-olds. Um, our organization took a decision that our principal investigators have one year to publish and then um, it becomes publicly accessible unless the donor precludes it. Most donors do not. So I actually think it's upon the universities who are I think often the worst um, in putting data into the public domain. Um, and the sort of open data movement in universities on curriculum and on publications. Um, and you know, you gotta put your money where you're where your mouth is, I now have a line item which encourages my faculty to use publicly accessible PLOS and, and those kind of journals um, and pay the fees and try to, to encourage people to use publicly accessible journals um, to try and um, get people in a culture where their data sets become public goods after a reasonable sunset period. And I, I think it's on the academic community to push harder on these issues. But can I just come back on the, the point you're making about the use of what we call new forms of data? And, and this is very much the subject of that report that I, I was referring to. Um, good science requires that research should be reproducible. I think that's a, an essential tenet of good science. In other words, if somebody's got some results, you want to know, well, what data did you use? Either because you want to replicate that to see whether they've use the right techniques or use the most appropriate data, or you might want to extend their research. And that's how science progresses. With new forms of data, where data are not necessarily being archived in a systematic way, where there are no written rules about how they might be used for research, where the ethics of using such data are often questionable, where data we're told are in the public domain because somebody clicked a little box so that they could use this piece of software. Did they read the 30 pages behind that? I never do. I'm sure other people don't as well. Is that consent? And is it appropriate then for those companies to put that data into the public domain? I think there are enormous ethical issues that we've got to address, and also issues about the very reproducibility of research which might be based upon new forms of data. Thanks very much. I must confess that uh, this makes me rather uncomfortable <laughs> because I'm, uh, what the ethical aspects of it. Most good research is individually driven. And I was brought up on the idea of establishing a hypothesis first. One of the things I worry about the large data sets, young people mining data and looking for something, rather than having a hypothesis and trying to find the data to, or do the experiment to generate the, 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 the necessary data. Does this worry you that uh, our training of scientists is going to have to be a lot different uh, in t if, if there's this mass of data readily available 
whether they will lose that inquisitiveness, which is such a natural part or normal part of good scientific uh, 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 advance. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is that we've really got to be a little bit more relaxed about what we call the scientific process. Um, yes, I was brought up to have a, a, you know, a theory-led, hypothesis-driven approach where you uh, then design an experiment and uh, create data and, uh, and, and pursue uh, what you consider to be some kind of causal mechanism or, or try to elaborate causal mechanisms. And you put that against having an enormous data set of many millions, sometimes billions of data points and doing some data mining. And quite honestly, the, the more data you have, the more statistical associations you're going to find in those data. And so people are going to be coming out with harebrained hypotheses and so on. But there's still the possibility that people will discover things or come up with new hypotheses, which will cause us to triangulate and to rethink, OK, um, what needs to be done here to try to explore this a little bit better? Maybe it might lead into a more traditional experimental design. But it's a way of kind of generating, um, oh, you can hardly call them hypotheses, but uh, it is a new world and it is one that we're not going to be able to stop. And I think we just have to embrace it and decide how we put it to good use. Kamala, I'm, I'm, I hesitate to sort of go away from the ethical side, but I wanted to build up on, on what um, Victoria talked about, the expenditure analysis, because um, I think what, what's happened now since that first Mozambique example is that expenditure analysis is now routine. And so, um, in fact, the, I wonder whether that those examples from Mozambique where they compared the two years was actually that partners didn't know what they were collecting in the first year and then they got better at what they collected in the second year. But now um, PEPFAR is rolling this out as, as um, mandatory, and it's actually mandatory um, from Congress, so that we'll have unit costs, we'll have regional costs, and the idea is that we can share this with, with governments. Um, and the question of transparency then becomes, well, they'll look and see, well, how much overhead have you got, and we can do it for we can do it for cheaper. So that that's that's one of the one of the <coughs> problems. But the other exciting thing is, I think that that um, they're also working with global funds, so that maybe there'll be some triangulation of data. So we'll only have one system, and then I think it become much more useful. So it's got huge potential, but it's it's really moved on. So it's interesting how they started with a pilot, and now it's become it's part of regular monitoring. Another part of regular monitoring. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure there's a question in there, but uh, no, I, I think it's it's been incredible to see how this this has uh, transformed, and I think it's been one area to see um, you know highly fruitful collaboration between PEPFAR and the Global Fund, whereas before there wasn't as much interaction. So I think this is one area for them to to have much stronger um, uh, collaborations. So, Mary. Hi, this is Mary Bassett from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Just to follow on and uh, on your remark, uh, Carmen, that I wonder what, if you can make any comment on the extent to which people in countries can get financial data that help them answer the question, could, what would it cost us to replicate this? In other words, um, from the Ministry of Health perspective, for example. So very often you can find data that say how much money was spent on an activity in the country but you don't know actually how much, how many of those dollars went to pay for actual activities or what those activities were as compared to paying for international staff or for mm -hmm. international contractors and so on. Is that Yeah, so clear? I mean, you know, I, I think these um, studies on unit costs are really still at an er early stage. There, there are huge issues about quality that still need to be addressed. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, to the extent to which, I, I actually I'm not totally clear, but I, I think that the stu some studies actually look at both uh, national costs as well as, you know, what the, what the donor is putting up as well. So it looks at both, both sides. No, I mean, for example, ICAP. I'm sorry, I'm not speaking for 
speaking to our web audience. <laughs> but for example, ICAP, yep. with, with due respect to all the very wonderful people who work at ICAP, um, uh, may be spending money to fund activities in a country that wouldn't be costs that that country would accrue if the Ministry of Health, for example, was implementing that project. But they, there's no way to disaggregate the data in that way. In other words, it's, mm -hmm. all, it's all donor funded, but some of the funds are go, go to spend for activities that are actually um, um, being conducted by people who are paid on international That's scales right, yeah. or yeah. to run offices. Uh, in yeah. country overhead, some of the things Carmen's just alluded to. Yeah, I, this I, may be a little too specific, right, right. but it does go to the question of replicability from a country perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I, oh, go, ahead. go, go ahead. I was going to say that I, with transition um, and, all, and this expenditure reporting becoming routine, um, some of the government partners now support directly site. Uh, HIV care and treatment scale up like in Rwanda, I think. And so they, I assume they did the same expenditure analysis and reporting that we did. Um, and so presumably PEPFAR would have those data. Yeah, I mean, in the case of uh, the CHAI also did a similar study and they did two different methodologies. And my understanding is that they looked at all the costs, not only the donor costs. So, you know, it should capture all that huge variation. And they, they did find that the majority of the costs were actually at the quote unquote above facility level, which means that it would be many of these sort of international type of, of, of uh, costs. Um, but I think another real, uh, real risk of this uh, expenditure analysis data is that if you don't look at, if you don't benchmark it to some performance measure, you know, it's, it's not actually, you know, a measure of quality. So you, you may be having lower unit costs, but, you know, adherence may be much lower. So it's really crucial to make sure that you, you link this um, information and cost to performance. Um, this is Shungi Demukerji from George Washington University. I just wanted to comment a little bit more on the expenditure um, data. Victoria knows that a couple of years ago, um, I did some work specifically in Ethiopia to look at Glo Global Fund HIV AIDS grants and to look at how money was being used to integrate sexual and reproductive health um, services through those grant financing mechanisms. And what we could get from the Secretariat, uh, with all due respect, was incredibly limited. Um, almost confusing um, for, for anybody who was familiar with what the, the implementing partners were doing in Ethiopia to then look at the grant agreements and the, and the, the budgets. Um, it was very strange to look at that. But when we got to country, um, and, and the, the, the context was that Ethiopia had just gone through a, an audit as well, so they had all their financial data organized. But they not only were able to give us the budget, the expenditures and the budgets by service delivery area, but we were actually able to get them by activities. And this was incredibly important because if we were trying to understand things like diagonal financing, we couldn't do it by looking at the SDAs. We had to look at what was actually being done. We got incredibly different results. And so there's also kind of a, I mean, and we had no trouble getting it. It was available, it was usable, it was you know, clean. Um, it was, we were able to triangulate among the different uh, princip principal recipients and the, and the LFA in terms of the, day, you know, the actual amounts. So <coughs> but what was interesting is you had to get to country to do that. Um, and, and I found that to be an odd challenge to remain at this level of evolution of the Global Fund. And there's been, I mean, you get so much disbursement data on their site but that doesn't help you actually understand what's going on. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a great point that um, there are different sources, and obviously the countries will have the best data. Um, but that said, I do think um, you know Ethiopia is probably a, a very good example where they do have really good quality country data, and it's unclear to me the extent to which variation across countries of that quality. So, are there other burning questions from the audience or the webcast? Uh, our Web audience. Well, if not, then we'll close with that example of triangulation, as that's going to be our, our next uh, topic, panel top is, is triangulating amongst um, available data sources. And I think the theme to leave with here is um, the importance of country uh, engagement and collaboration in their use of data. So we'll, re we'll um, reconvene at 4.30. We'll try. Or try. Thank you. Thank you.